1941, Europe was on the verge of what would become World War II. London was especially vulnerable as the Air Force of Hitler was not very far away. And if you're a history buff, you will remember that in late 1940 and early 1941, Hitler's Air Force bombed London and the surrounding areas for 57 consecutive days. Also in 1941, in a bid amid this backdrop of war, an author and a professor of English literature named C.S. Lewis wrote a, short, a series of short stories. Those short stories appeared in a London weekly periodical, and collectively, they became known as the screw tape letters. Lewis wrote about the facing of temptation. He wrote about uh, facing Satan and the, and the everyday ways that Satan attacks us through temptation, and he used two very unique characters in order to do it. Two fictional characters, both who were employees of Satan, employed as tempters. One was named Screwtape, he was the elder, and he was writing a series of letters to his nephew, Wormwood, who was a junior tempter. Wormwood seemed to have a little bit of problem going about his daily business of tempting people and getting them to try to leave God and come over to the dark side. And Screwtape, constantly throughout the book, gives him different ideas, better ways to doing it, and so on. What I find interesting about the book, certainly the book itself is not, is not inspired in any way, but what I find interesting about it is that those temptations that Lewis wrote about through screw tape in 1941 are exactly the same temptations that we face today. And as Christians, we would expect this, would we not? After all, Satan only has so many arrows in the quiver. That manner in which he tempted Adam and Eve in the garden were the same arrows that he used to tempt Job, the same arrows that he used to tempt Jesus in the wilderness, the same for the Londoners of 1941, and the same for us in 2023. Solomon was correct when he said what? There is certainly nothing new under the sun. This morning, I want to use one of Screwtape's letters to illustrate a manner of temptation that Satan puts in front of us on a daily basis. And how are we going to answer that temptation? We're going to look at how Screwtape put it to Wormwood, but we're going to answer it with Scripture in the same manner that Jesus, our Lord and Savior, did so in the wilderness some 2,000 years ago. <clears throat> In letter 12, Screwtape lectures Wormwood on the size of the sin. And he doesn't quote the Lord's brother James when he does this, but you can see the truth of Scripture in what Screwtape is talking about because it's not the size of the sin that matters. Sin is sin. Screwtape says, It does not matter how small the sins are provided that the cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, the soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. Do you recognize truth of Scripture in what Lewis wrote in this particular chapter? We know Jesus in Matthew chapter 7 when he talks about the path to destruction, which is broad. And we also understand James, our, bro our Lord's brother James, when he wrote in chapter 4, to him that knows to do good and does not, to him it is sin. What Lewis describes in this particular chapter, and what I believe to be a particularly seductive method of temptation, because it is so innocuous, because it is invisible, is what Lewis himself is called, and what I'm calling this morning, the danger of nothing. You know, Satan does not mind us being good people, at least up to a point. Satan's targets can be divided into two people. There are those of us who are Christians, but perhaps we're lukewarm. And there are others we know, and some who may be here this morning, who are good people, who believe that 
that God is the creator who believe that Jesus is the son of God, but have never taken the opportunity to obey the gospel, to put on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through baptism. You know, John wrote in his vision that because the Laodicean Christians were lukewarm, that Jesus would spew them out of his mouth. Not a pretty picture, is it? And Jesus himself said that not everyone who calls upon me will enter heaven, but only those that do what? That do the will of the Father. On that day, we may believe that we are close to God, only to find out that we have become comfortable in absolute darkness. We can be good people who talk about giving to the poor, but who do not. We can be good people who talk about the need for Bible study, but who rarely open God's Word. We can be good people who serve on the boards of philanthropic organizations or perhaps mentor our youth, but don't take the time to lead someone to Christ. Please understand that your toes are not the ones that I'm stepping on this morning. Several years ago when we provided preachers to go out to Belle Glade, I was an active part of that. And I learned a valuable lesson by doing that, that first and foremost, when I prepare a sermon, I'm preaching to me. You know, I've been a Christian for almost 55 years. Matter of fact, just in a couple of weeks, 55 years now that I think about it. And I can get up every morning and I can look in the mirror and I can say, you know what, Richard, you deserve a break today. Sit back, kick the chair up, put your feet up, do nothing. Is that what God expects of a Christian? I believe that when I say that, and if I do that, Satan smiles. In the year that I graduated high school, which was a long, long time ago, there was a top ten song by a Canadian band called Taking Care of Business. Some of you probably remember it. Remember the chorus? There was a line in the chorus that says, I love to work at nothing all day. Last year when I retired from a long and distinguished career as a bean counter, I told a friend of mine, I said, that's my theme song. I love to work at nothing all day. And as soon as I said it, I really regretted it. And I knew that I shouldn't have. James talks about doing nothing in his epistle. We read this morning in the second chapter uh, that person who is naked and destitute of food, and what do we say to them? Go, depart, be warmed, be filled. How much good is that doing when we don't do anything about it? But if we feel good about that kind of approach, then we are that person that Satan wants to keep under his thumb through doing nothing. Because we are on that line carrying us into darkness, and once we figure out that we're the frog in the boiling water, it's going to be too late. So what do we do against the urge to do nothing? Seven points this morning regarding the danger of nothing. First, we need to navigate towards God. If you've got your, your Bibles, and I hope you do, if not, pull one out from in front of you because I don't have it for the screen. But look in Joshua chapter 1. When we get to the book of Joshua, Israel has spent their 40 years in the wilderness. That generation that did not have faith, that came back from the initial foray into the land of Canaan and said the people are too big, we can't do it, have all died off. Israel is now poised to cross over the River Jordan and go to their first target, Jericho. God comes to Joshua in chapter 1, and in verse 5 through 9, he tells Joshua how things will be better and how Israel will prevail. Let me read verse 5 through 9. Read with me, please. This is God talking to Joshua. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life, as I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Again, only be strong and be very courageous. 
I hope we're letting that sink in. That you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. We'll do a pregnant pause left right there and let that sink in for just a second. Meditate on it day and night. That you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage, do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Meditate day and night. You know, when we get up in the morning, we may go and stand in front of the mirror and we may declare to the mirror that today is going to be God's day. We are going to be God's servants today. We are going to go about God's business. And then we leave that mirror and we go and we fasten the knot on our tie and we put the briefcase over our shoulder and we get in the car and we go to work. Or in today's culture, we may simply brush our teeth, leave our pajamas on, walk to the next room, get on the computer and do whatever it is that we have to do. But Satan is okay with us making this declaration in the morning as long as we don't do anything about it the rest of the day. And how many times do we do that and start our day with good intentions, but let the, the, the everyday busyness of life and our work get in our way as we go throughout the rest of the day? What was Joshua's job, by the way? What was his position? He was president, he was prime minister, he was commander in chief, he was general of the army, he was chief cook and bottle washer. Do you think that his days were full being in charge of all those Israelites? How busy are we? How busy was he? And what did God know that would cause Joshua to be successful and cause Israel to be successful in the way that they carried out their job. He said, meditate in the law day and night. Is that any less true for us? You know, God says, and one of my favorite verses is 2 Chronicle chapter 16, verse 9. God says in it, his eyes go, or his eyes roam to and fro throughout the earth, seeking those whose heart is loyal to him. You know, if we navigate towards God, do we understand that God will find us? Amen. I hope we do. We need to understand that obedience is a continual action. Back to those Israelites in, in uh, Exodus chapter 19. God comes to Moses and he says, If you will obey me, if the people will obey me, I will make you a holy nation. I will make you a treasure. You will be my treasure. He makes it clear to Moses that the Lord belongs, the, the earth belongs to the Lord, belongs to him, not to Satan. Satan wants us to believe that we have no power over sin. Satan wants us to, to shrink back and question whether it makes a difference if we visit the sick or if we provide to those who can't provide for themselves. He wants us to believe that even if we preach, no one will listen. So why even try? In the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah, the first part of the book has Jeremiah trying to convince Judah not to go and do as Israel did, not to fall away from God because if you do, you will be taken into captivity. That's his message. In the latter part of the book, Jeremiah's message has to change because Judah does not listen to Jeremiah. In that case, Jeremiah becomes... Um, the prophet of the bad things that are about to come. And because of that, he's viewed as a traitor. Jeremiah was persecuted more so than any other prophet because he brought this message. Jeremiah describes Israel's religion as an external one without true devotion of heart, and then he describes it as worthless. Do you want to have your own religion described as worthless? 
that would seem to me to be something that I would want to try to avoid. In the third chapter of Jeremiah, seven times he uses the term backsliding to describe Israel. And yet what do we know from studying our Bible, from looking at the Old Testament, from looking at Exodus and Deuteronomy, looking at Joshua, Judges, and so on and so forth, into the Kings and Chronicles? What do we know about God? Who falls away, God or us? We do. We, see, we cease to be obedient, but yet even in our, our disobedience, God is always there for us. God says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus actually said that. I, I skipped a, a reference to the book of John in the Gospel of John. Jesus says it on more than one occasion. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. We need to trust God to have our back. Isaiah prophesied during the reign of King Hezekiah. The dominant power of the day was Assyria. Sennacherib was in charge when Hezekiah was king. The northern kingdom had already fallen to Assyria. You may remember that Hezekiah actually entered into an alliance with Egypt and with Tyre in order to try to withstand Assyria because he knew what was coming. Assyria had actually already come into Judah when it encamped around Jerusalem when Sennacherib put his almost 200,000 soldiers around the city of Jerusalem. At that particular point in time, Sennacherib had already taken 46 Judean cities and almost 200,000 prisoners. And he sieges Jerusalem. He puts his army completely around it. And he threatens Hezekiah, and he threatens the, the inhabitants, the citizens of Jerusalem. He says, in whom do you trust? I hope you don't trust in Egypt. They'll let you down. You need to trust in me, Sennacherib says. As a matter of fact, he goes on and he says, you know what? You need to trust in me because... The God you serve has sent me to take you into captivity. Really? The audacity of Sennacherib to make such a statement. But he does that, and he does it day after day after day outside the walls of Jerusalem. At one point he says, you know, I'll give you 2,000 horses, and then sarcastically says, if you had riders to put on them. He knows that they don't have that. And he's pushing every button that he possibly can in order to get Jerusalem to give in. To open the gates, let Sennacherib and the Assyrian army in and take them into captivity. There comes a day when it finally, he's, I guess he's had enough because as this taunting goes on and on and on, there is a day in which he has a letter delivered to Hezekiah. And it's one of those last chance letters. I don't know exactly what was in it. We're not told in Scripture, but you can kind of get the idea that Sennacherib delivers a letter. The letter is taken to Hezekiah. It reads something along the lines of, you need to give up or else because I'm coming through the walls one way or another. I'm going to take care of the problem and you're going to serve me. What does Hezekiah do with that letter? Do you remember? He takes that letter to the temple and he spreads it before God. And he prays. God hears that prayer. God goes to Isaiah. And he says, Isaiah, you need to go tell Hezekiah that I have his back, that I have Jerusalem's back, and that Sennacherib and the Assyrian army will not come into the walls of this city. Israel wakes up. They look outside the walls of the city. And instead of seeing Sennacherib's army, they see the dead corpses, the rotting corpses of 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. Who did that? God did that. God truly did have Jerusalem's back. You know, Sennacherib left. He went home with his tail between his legs, so to speak. He went into his own private temple and when he did so, worshiping his own false god, his sons came in and killed him. God has our back. 
We need to navigate towards God. We need to understand that obedience is a continual action. We need to trust God to have our back. And we need to understand that hell's path is a gentle and a gradual slope. Satan did not tempt Adam and Eve to murder or to steal. He tempted them not to trust God. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus warns us of a world that is full of false prophets. They come disguised and their intent is to take us away from God. We need to understand in today's post-modern world, false teachers don't actually exist. Oh, they do, but they've they've been rebranded as simply those who portray theological differences of of insignificant consequence. Think about that. Not a false teacher, simply someone who espouses a theological difference of insignificant consequence. And my question to you is, can false doctrine ever be insignificant? Jesus says, beware of these false teachers, right? And he says, you will know how to see them by their fruits or their lack thereof. What happens to the unfruitful tree? You chop it down, you use it for firewood. Claiming to be a great teacher or a tireless worker does not make you one. Claiming to have a previously unknown truth or portraying scripture as being out of touch with today's culture is a deadly and a dangerous game. In Matthew chapter 7, if you have your Bibles, again, if you go there, please, and read with me. In Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I have a note in my Bible directly underneath chapter or verse 23. Eric Owens, when he was here several years ago at at our gospel meeting or lectureship, whichever one, he he said as he read that, he said, he wrote down in his Bible, the saddest scene he has ever seen. Is that what we want to hear on the day of judgment? Depart from me, I never knew you. We need to immunize ourselves to Satan. It goes without saying that as Christians, we are expected to be in the Word. I think we recognize that picking up God's Word occasionally to read an inspirational verse or two is not being in the Word. We are in the middle of studying this year, 2023, as a church, a chapter a day. I hope everyone is keeping up, but even if you haven't kept up, even if you've missed a few days and you're behind, start tomorrow back where you left off. It is a wonderful thing to get up and to read God's Word and to study God's Word and answer questions about God's Word and have a Bible study with your family, your wife, your children, whatever the case might be. How do we equip ourselves to deal with temptations? How did Jesus do it in the wilderness? For the longest time, My mental picture of Jesus, and this goes back to when I first heard this story and it registered, maybe I was eight or nine years old. But I heard this story and I heard about Jesus being tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. And then Satan comes and we've got three temptations, right? In my head, this was Jesus in the wilderness, 40 days, prayer and fasting. Then suddenly Satan comes and bang, 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 three temptations, lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, pride of life, and that was it, and he left. Look in Luke chapter 4, verse 2. Luke paints an extended picture of this, and he makes it clear that during the 40 days that Jesus was in the wilderness, he was being tempted by Satan. Three types of temptation? Absolutely. Absolutely. 40 days of three types of temptation. Absolutely. How did Jesus defeat Satan? 
He quoted Scripture. He knew it. Can this be any less true for us? We need to be in the Word. John chapter 1, what does it say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It is a wonderful thing to understand that when we are in the Word, we are not just reading God's Word, we are communing with Him. We are in close and personal contact with our God. We need to nurture our faith and never retire from Christianity. I'm not sure if there's a better story in Scripture regarding living a lifelong faith than that of Daniel. Daniel was taken into captivity by the Babylonians when he was 16 years old. Nebuchadnezzar saw something special in Daniel and his three friends. He inscripted them in the government service, and Daniel spent a lifetime doing just that, working for the enemy, so to speak. Daniel served Nebuchadnezzar. He served Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belshazzar. And when we get to chapter 6, the lion's den chapter, Daniel was serving um, Darius. Darius was a, was a Persian king, not a Babylonian king. Politics had changed a little bit on that part of it. But at this point in his life, Daniel is in his mid-80s. He's a governor. And Darius is thinking about promoting him even more beyond that of being just a governor. And of course, as things generally happen, there are those around who see what's going on. They don't like the fact that, that Daniel, this foreigner, is getting a high position. And so they go to the king and they say, Oh, good king Darius, live forever. Would you please consider this, passing a law that anyone who prays to anyone other than yourself for the next uh, time frame, whatever that was, uh, 30 days, I think. I can't remember. My memory left me all of a sudden. It says, anybody that prays to anybody other than you will be thrown into the lion's den. Darius says, I like it. Signs off on it. Executive order number whatever, BC-1. Those people go back and they wait for Daniel to do what? To pray to his God. As soon as he does, they take him back before Darius. Darius sees it and the light comes on. Darius does not want to throw Daniel into the lion's den, but a law is a law. And so he does. And he says, Daniel, I hope your God will protect you. He goes home. He doesn't sleep. He gets up early in the morning. He goes back. 85-year-old Daniel's in the bottom of that pit in that lion's den. And he says, Daniel, are you okay? And Daniel says, yes, I am. Darius has him taken out of the pit, and we know the rest of the story. Those that were responsible for this atrocity were called before him. They were thrown in the lion's den, and what does Scripture say about it? They were dead before they even hit the bottom of the pit. When people around us, or even our government, tries to make being a Christian difficult, do we step back, or do we step up? Time does not permit me this morning to do a deep dive into the life of Paul. But when he writes his second letter to Timothy, the last book that he will write, he knows the end is near. And what does he say to Timothy? He says he has fought the good fight. He has finished the race. You know, Paul did not know how to do anything other than preach the gospel. And he did it until his dying breath. Last point. We need to glorify heaven. We spend a lot of time talking about the negative, about it's a beautiful alternative to the horrible alternative of hell. I'm not sure we spend as much time thinking about just how glorious it will be. In class this morning, we talked about not laying up for ourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. We know we cannot take it with us to heaven, do we not? We understand that. And yet sometimes we, act, we uh, uh, 
carry out our lives as if though we can take it with us. I don't want to pick on the ladies, but maybe you've got a, a bracelet or a, a ring or a necklace that you think would be just perfect in heaven, right? You know, I know a guy, I've got to pick on the guys a little bit too, but I know a guy who has a truck that he just loves. He loves it so much he thinks it's the best looking truck there is. And even when he's driving down the road and an identical truck passes him, he looks over and he says, well, my truck's a better looking truck than that. And he starts to go wash that truck. And when I go put that, I mean, when he goes and puts that Meguiar's classic gold on that truck, and then he puts that tire shine on the tires, and that truck just pops, and he thinks, you know, this truck could be parked because I could back into a parking place on the streets of gold and I could cut those wheels just a little bit to the left and that would be the best looking thing I've ever seen. You know this is in jest, right? You understand that I'm talking facetiously. You also understand that I'm speaking in sarcasm, a language in which I am fluent. <laughs> Debbie will back me up on that, by the way. There is nothing that we can do that would make heaven better than what it's going to be. There's nothing that we have here that we could take with us. Again, back to our class this morning, we cannot serve two masters, and that's exactly what I'm doing when I put that truck over God. When we describe the glory of heaven, it's not unusual for us to think about it in terms of gold, streets of gold, rubies of sapphires, and things of that nature. Because that's our frame of reference, and that's how John gave us several descriptions. But look in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4. Because I want us to think about a place where there will be no more death, there will be no more sorrow, there will be no more tears, because there will be no crying. I want to be there. I don't understand exactly how those things that have given me pain and sorrow and have caused me tears here on this earth are not going to impact me when I get to heaven. But God says it right here. And I'm just going to Deuteronomy 29, 29 it and say that it's on a need to know basis and I don't have a need to understand it right now. But when I get to heaven, it's going to be this way. I want to be there because God is there. I want to be there because His Son is there. I want to be there because the Holy Spirit is there. I want to be there because Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, Peter, Paul, James, will all be there. I want to be there and be in that light. When Moses went up on the mountain to talk to God, he came back down and his face shone in such a way that those who were around him said, you've got to put on a veil. We can't look at you. Your face is too bright. I want to be in that light in heaven. There is, and I guess actually I fibbed a minute ago when I said that was my last point, because there is one more. We cannot talk about the danger of nothing with talk, without talking about the danger of doing nothing to obey God's plan of salvation. You know, there are a series of scriptures that go throughout the New Testament that talk to us specifically about what it takes to become a Christian, what it means to become a Christian, what it means to enter into the kingdom, what it means to enter into the Lord's church, what it means to have salvation. As I was putting this part of the lesson together and the scriptures are on the board and we know God's plan of salvation by heart, right? We believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, we repent of our sins, we confess in front of others that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We are baptized, and then we live a life that is faithful thereafter. 
I cannot put a lesson like this together without thinking about a Bible study that I had some 30 years ago when I went on a mission trip to Minsk, Belarus. There was a young man, he was a pediatrician, and I had a Bible study with him consecutive days. And we got to the point where I knew that he knew everything that we had talked about, and, and I thought he believed it. And I said, are you ready to be baptized? And he says, no, I'm not. And I went back and I said, do you believe that this is God's word? And I held up my Bible. And he said, yes, I do. And I said, do you believe that God sent his son here to this planet, to earth? He said, yes, I do. Do you believe that, that that God's son lived as a man and he was crucified on a cross and gave up his life so that sin might be defeated, so that Satan might be defeated once and for all? And this young man said, yes, I do believe that. I said, do you believe that you need to be baptized to be able to go to heaven? He says, yes, I believe that too. And I said, but why won't you? And he just shrugged his soldiers, his shoulders and says, I don't know. And I have prayed for that young man off and on for 30 years. We had the congregation I was a part of at that particular time had several more trips behind the Iron Curtain or behind the old Iron Curtain after I went. To my knowledge, this young man never came back and had any more Bible studies, never became a Christian. Sad. My question is, are you here today where this young man was 30 years ago and you've never taken that final step? You know what needs to be done. The question is, why do you wait? I cannot answer it for you. Perhaps you're here and you're a Christian, but you've fallen away. Either case, this invitation is for you to step out in that aisle and to come to the front and to make your intentions know to get right with God. Will you fight the temptation to do nothing this morning as we stand and as we sing?